Uh, we're thrilled to be co-hosting this session with our uh, friends at Shift and joined by uh, Andrew Friedman, who is one of our panelists today. Uh, Shift is a tech-enabled firm with over 20 years of experience in everything from organizational design and change management to employment engagement and cultural transformation. Uh, as we go through the webinar, I think you'll find Andrew has a wealth of knowledge, not only in the burnout topic uh, we'll be discussing today, uh, but also uh, Andrew and the SHIFT team has expertise in helping your organization connect your employees and inspire change. Uh, from this slide, you can see that SHIFT has acquired an employee engagement platform called Latch. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Latch and how SHIFT uh, can help your organization, just let us know and we can connect you up after uh, this uh, webinar. Finally, for this session, if you have a question for the panel, please use the Q&A section of the software. If you see a question on there you would like answered, you can upvote that question and it will rise to the top of the list and we will get to as many of those as time allows. So thank you all again uh, for joining us today. And just to get us kicked off, I'd like each one of you to just give a quick introduction to yourself, a little bit about your uh, background and organization. And uh, Andrew, let's start with you. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, you hit some of the work stuff, so I'll start with non-work stuff. Uh, Andrew Friedman, I am a, a husband, a dog dad, a mentor in the Big Brothers program. I've got a terrible voice, but I love to sing. I've got really corny humor, what people tell me, but I'm a frequent dad joke teller. And uh, as you mentioned, I, I do have over 25 years of experience in really helping leaders transform talent and potential in their organizations into tangible business results. So everything around building a healthy and high performance culture is what I do as a managing partner at Shift. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Uh, Sarka. Hey everyone, thanks for having me here today. Um, I am in the Virginia area. Um, I have most recently been a chief talent officer of a rapidly growing global company. Um, my background spans a lot of different areas from management consulting and government contracting, um, helping small businesses grow rapidly, help to scale um, and automate their infrastructure, while also supporting the overall sort of employee experience and people engagement of an organization. So um, really excited to be here today talking with all of you about burnout. Thanks so much for joining us, Sarka. Uh, Trey. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm uh, Trey Whitney, and I'm excited to be here as well with this uh, distinguished panel and this uh, amazing group of uh, individuals. I'm also in the um, DC area, and I am the interim chief people officer for Splunk. We're a data company, and I am um, have over 20 plus years of HR experience where I love to connect the employee experience to the uh, to the customer experience and really drive um, growth and development within our talent space. So looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Trey. Uh, Joan. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm Joan McGrail. It's great to be with you today. I am the CHRO for New Balance Athletics. We're headquartered in Boston. We have more than 40 offices around the globe, and we proudly employ more than 8,000 associates around the world. This is a topic near and dear. Uh, to me and certainly to New Balance. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Mike. Well, oh, thanks so much, Joan. And uh, you put it very well. I think, you know, the, the burnout topic is near and dear to a lot of our hearts. I think if uh, we don't see it within our organization, um, you know, we felt it at some point in our career, most likely. So I think it's a, definitely an interesting topic. And Andrew, I want to start with you. Um, you know, just to help define, you know, with some of the research you've done and some of your experience, experiences of, of burnout. You know, I think, you know, all of us have felt something at some point, but, it, you know, sometimes maybe it's just a bad day, right? Or I didn't get enough sleep and I'm just tired and I just don't want to work today. But, you know, is that really burnout or is it something more than that? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what really is burnout and what are some of the uh, symptoms or um, some of the, the things that you look for to know that somebody may really be burning out? I, I certainly can. And I'll start by saying this is a conversation that I know will be full of optimism and possibilities. And I mean that I'm not being sarcastic. You know, even though we're talking about burnout and some people are like, oh, my God, this is such a tough topic. It really is all about possibilities. So I'll start with, you know, the, what the World Health Organization defined burnout as, you know, in some of their recent research and, and their definitions. And so they termed burnout as an occupational phenomenon occupational phenomenon. And it's not just that it was brought on by the pandemic. Burnout was a thing pre-pandemic, but it's certainly been exacerbated. And when the World Health Organization and others like Shift and McKinsey and Corn Ferry, and, you know, numbers of other organizations that do research, um, when they study this really came down to three major things. It's about increased mental distance from one's job, 
Um, and that connects to energy depletion or exhaustion. It's about feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. And it's also about reduced professional efficacy. And so the, the thing about this is, Mike, it's really about a system, the workplace system that bring these things to life. That's what's happening. So all those things that you mentioned, I'm feeling a little tired, I'm feeling a little under-inspired, I'm feeling a little depleted. Those things happen for sure. But what we're talking about here is a, is a systemic issue that is um, really holistic at the organizational level. And I can give you, based on our and other research, some things that people on this call and off this call should be looking for. First thing is you wanna think about the responsibility of a leader. The, the leader's responsibility is to create a, a barrier-free work environment, one where people can be and do their very best every day. And there are three main influences that leaders are responsible for uh, taking care of to make sure that people can do their best. And those three, Mike, are the environment, systems, and resources of the organization, um, expectations and feedback, making sure that expectations are clear and feedback is useful, and then rewards, recognition, and consequences. Those three influences are in place and they're aligned systemically so that people can do their very best. When those things are not aligned, what you start to see are things like untenable workloads. And we've seen a lot of that through the pandemic and, and past that with things like the great resignation. You've got a lot of employees have left, but the work needs to go somewhere. And so there's these untenable and unbalanced workloads that are a contributing factor to burnout. The second thing is a lack, lack of control or perceived control. People are really feeling, Mike, like they just don't have a say, they don't have agency. And so that, that's back to that environment piece um, in an organization. Um, unfairness. People are experiencing like, you know, it's just not a level playing field. And some people, whether it's because of tenure or role or title, um, that they're getting preferential treatment. Um, lack of community or connection. You mentioned latch. That's one of the things we do to help organizations fuse their people better. But when there's a lack of community and connection, the, the burnout rises. And then the last two I mentioned were rewards and recognition. When those things aren't aligned to what the organization values, it's a problem. And then a mismatch of values, what the company values with what the individual values. So that, at a summary level, that's a lot of what our research shows. That's what I would want your, you know, the folks who have joined us today to hear and to think about, and maybe to get curious about as we go through this conversation, ask our panelists some questions about those things, certainly type them in the Q&A. There's a lot we can unpack there. And I will tell you, I'm psyched for the discussion uh, because I know the panelists that we have here are experts at what they do, and they've got lots of ideas on how they have helped to address some of these things in their companies. Thanks so much, Andrew. Lots to go over there. About 20 questions popped into my head as you're going through that, but I'm sure we'll get to a lot of those. Um, so, so Trey, you know, within your organization, um, you know, are, I, I assume you're experiencing or you're seeing some level of burnout. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing within your organization and how it's impacting uh, your workforce over the past couple of years? Absolutely. I mean, we we pride ourselves on being a data company and and using uh, human capital inputs as data is an important metric for us. And so we're seeing a, a, a number of either input or output trends that that are um, giving us insights or at least early warning or sometimes too late of a warning around burnout. Um, attrition, attrition is definitely spiking while we're a bit lower than our tech partners, um, we were in the high 20s, um, and that's um, almost double what we've seen um, pre-pandemic, um, if we wanted to use that as a marker. We're looking, at, um, we're looking at what we're getting through our listening channels, whether it's our engagement survey, our internal social media channels, what we're learning in town hall meetings um, is suggesting that, that people want, you know, focus, they want prioritization, they want um, to really understand um, what's happening and they're connecting it to confidence in the company and confidence to leadership. And then the third one and, um, is really we're looking at some of the insights and data coming from our, um, from our benefits information. Um, it's trending to be one of the top five um, issues. Behavioral health is, is coming through quite strongly in, in, in our claims. And so across that myriad of uh, data points across the employee experience and the employee journey. Um, it's important for us to use that as an input and then to Andrew's point, look at what are the, the levers or the knobs that we can pull to make sure that all of our practices, not just our talent practices, but our management practices 
are actually responding to it. And, and we have this insight and we're responding to it, but very much like our colleagues and what Andrew said, it's a journey for us. Um, and so we really are taking the time to make sure that we are listening um, and learning from other professionals to be able to implement such things as um, as looking at our, uh, you know, our work design in specific areas and then everything up to um, benefit um, offerings that we're trying to address these issues. So very broad, um, lots of things to, um, to respond to, but we're letting the data and the voice of our employees really drive our prioritization and our response. Thanks, Trey. And, and Joan, same question at New Balance. You know, how are you, what are you seeing within your organization and, and how is it affecting your workforce as far as you know that that engagement and inspiration and you know maybe some uh, attrition what are you seeing within your organization yeah it's been really interesting to see and I'll, I'll share just um, briefly by way of background we have historically kind of pre-pandemic always taken um, a lot of pride in our ability to come together during a crisis and so New Balance is very collaborative by way of culture and also very entrepreneurial. What's been really interesting is so while we were able to jump into that pattern, that established pattern of coming together in crisis, what we have definitely found is there is no reprieve. And I know you're all experiencing that as well, right? And so pre-pandemic, where we had an opportunity to um, kind of rest, recharge, exhale, et cetera, we have just not seen that opportunity um, in, in any way in the past couple of years. By way of results, what's interesting is we have not seen productivity dip. Um, and uh, while that on the one hand is good, we know that's not the whole story. And so we know for sure that the people behind the results are definitely feeling the pressure, growing increasingly fatigue, and in some cases, disenchanted, and, and that matters very much to us. By way of turnover, we have not seen a spike in office-based turnover, but we have definitely seen on the front lines, particularly in our US factories, an increase in uh, turnover as more and more associates really question the role of work in their lives. So I'll, I'll finish this uh, question, Mike, just with the point that, you know, we continue to talk about and really call out the need for our, our work to be purposeful and not just productive. We've done some work in support of this, but admittedly, uh, we have more work to do here. Thanks, hey, Joan. And, and Sarka, Joan brought up an interesting point that they haven't really seen a, a drop off in um, productivity at, at this point. And I know when the pandemic first hit, we've heard a lot of organizations that said, you know, hey, it was crisis mode. So everybody kind of stepped up and, and that may be contributing to some of the burnout as we go down the road. And if you haven't seen that drop off, you know, potentially it could be a cliff coming, right? Who knows if they're you know, doing extra work to try to continue that productivity, it may be coming. What's your thoughts around that? And have you seen that with some of your experiences as far as uh, trying to identify the burnout and then how that relates to productivity? I yeah, we haven't, you know, in my experience, we hadn't seen much productivity dip either. Um, although we're experiencing the same thing that both Joan and Trey have mentioned is, um, it, you know, increased in, in turnover and attrition. Um, but what's interesting in, in what, we, what I've seen in times like that is smaller communities and smaller teams coming together to support one another, um, which I have found, I mean, it's definitely done a lot to strengthen smaller teams um, and even cross collaboration across teams where people are trying to come together to really support one another and be in the trenches, in the trenches together as these things are happening. Um, which has been at least some positive that's come out of a situation like this. However, with that, with that amount of attrition and turnover, um, it is hard, obviously, to keep pace with getting people and the right people in seat that, that fit the skills, but also fit the culture, um, while not having someone else have to obviously take the burden because the work still has to get done. And so when, you know, Trey mentioned this and Joan did as well, a lot of just really rethinking work redesign and job redesign, um, I think we've also learned a lot about jobs that can be done differently or in the absence of having you know, positions where we've had turnover, rethinking how we might be able to deliver on a certain product or rethinking how we might be able to rejigger a specific team to be able to still hit 
those goals and objectives. And it's really opened up the aperture to think through, okay, maybe we could do this differently and we could do this with less, or if we focused on process improvement here and automation, this could really help, you know, burnout in this regard. Um, so it, while, while there obviously are a lot of negative impacts from burnout, um, I also choose to see some of the positivity that's coming as, as um, Andrew mentioned earlier, is where we're seeing a little bit more connection in some of those areas across people and really trying to drive a bit more on, on cross collaboration as well. Thanks, Arka. And, and Andrew, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, organization trying to um, respond to burnout and trying to create some policies, procedure, maybe even a culture that helps individuals. You know, burnout can be a very individual thing. You know, what might be burning one person out might be inspiring somebody else, you know, with that, the way that things are happening. And, you know, some people get energized by crisis mode, for example. Can you talk a little bit about how you try to balance that and where are, you know, is setting policies and procedures enough or is there things that we, that an organization needs to do more than just saying, Hey, take Fridays off or, Hey, you know, you know, those kinds of things. Can you talk about your perspective on that? Yeah, for, for sure. There's a lot there. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm going to start with the last part first and then, uh, and then work from there. We see a lot of organizations who are trying really, really hard to make sure that their people feel valued, that they're being taken care of. You know, they're trying all kinds of things from um, wellness days, extra days off, stipends that people can spend on things, you know, like massages or yoga or meditation. You know, they're doing, uh, make, giving access to fitness apps that people can take advantage of, all those kinds of things. And I think from an, from an intention standpoint, that's great. But I'm going to keep going back to this holistic and systemic word to say, when not when not done in a holistic approach, it can be experienced by the employees. I and mean, we we hear this in all the companies that we've worked with, and we've worked with over 700, by, you know, by this point, employees experience that as a flavor of the day, episodic, and actually, it's a you know, with positive intent it comes sometimes with negative consequences. Here's what I mean: if you offer me an extra day off. But the way that work is done hasn't changed. I don't really want to take that extra day off because when I come back, I'm going to have 150 more emails and more work that you know that's piled up. And so it's like, are you really giving me a benefit, or are you actually, you know, am I am I going to get crushed by that? So I think instead of policies and procedures, starting there, Mike, the way to, to think about it is think right to left. Right? That's what I would encourage everybody on this call to think about: right to left, which is what are the outcomes that you desire. It's time to take another look at redefining what kind of culture do we want, whether you've got people in the office, hybrid, fully remote, whatever it is. It's not to say we don't have a culture. Or we do have a culture. It's like we hear we hear lots of leaders say we have to bring people back into the office because that's how we have culture. I, I, I disagree with that. You have a culture. Is it the one you want? Is it the one that fills you up? Is it the one that aligns with your vision? Not sure. So that's where I would start is. Look at, look at the vision, does it still hold true? Look at the culture that you have and think about the culture that you want. And sometimes what we've seen around the productivity piece, I'll connect this to your question. Productivity has gone up in many organizations, but it comes at a cost, which is you know the average worker in many organizations we've studied are actually logging at least four more hours a day. So my question is, is that really productivity? Is that really improved productivity? Like they're more output, sure. But are they are they you know are they more productive in what they do? And sometimes that's happening, Mike, because you've got leaders, and I am going to put this one on leaders. You've got leaders who are trying to shoehorn old ways of thinking and operating into new business realities, and that just doesn't work. So if, for example, I'm a leader who defines some of your value by what time you came into the office every day and what time you left, or how responsive you are to emails, or how many meetings you attended, I. I I need a new way to operate in this remote and hybrid world. So what's happening? Some of those leaders are emailing their people earlier and they're seeing, are there people online early? Are they responding to emails at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 10, you know, 10 at night, midnight? And if they're not, you know, the old way of thinking is, well, you're not working hard enough. Why aren't you online? Why did it take you so long to respond, right? And so what you're finding is people are, because many of them are working from home, there is no relief. They're waking up and their phone's right next to their bed. They're online early, they're not taking breaks, they're accessible all day. And so I think, you know, to, to put a fine point on the answer to your question, it's not about policies and procedures as much as it is a mindset and a culture shift, and then making sure that work, the way that it flows, the way that we lead, the way that we empower people, the way that we hold accountable, 
all needs to ladder up to that. That's thinking from the, the right, the outcome first, and then redesigning the way that work happens from there. That's the best way to do it from what we know and, and the expertise that we have. Thanks, Andrew. And before I get to Trey, a question came in, which I think sort of accentuates what you just said is, you know, what do you say to companies that have unlimited PTO that are still facing burnout, right? That's an example of exactly what you talked about is, hey, I can really take that PTO and not have consequences when I come back, you know, more work, right? That's kind of your, your point of, of that topic. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, and you know whether it's unlimited PTO uh, or not unlimited PTO, you know, it, you know, I think the the thing is around safety. This gets to some of the psychological safety and workflow, which is you know it can be really helpful. Uh, one thing is for employees to see leaders take off and then be unplugged. So here's the thing: if I'm a leader and I take off, but I'm still firing out emails and I'm still logging on to meetings, then the message that I'm sending to my people is it's not okay to actually take time off. Right? You have to be plugged in because you're watching me do it. So it's like, no, don't do as I say, do as I do. So people have to realize that you can take off, you can unplug. And, you know, from a skill development standpoint, a workflow standpoint, you know, we, we need to make sure that if there are critical things that need to happen, that there's backstops and there's, you know, there's backfills and there's additional ways for work to continue. And in fact, the reality is, Mike, some of this stuff can frankly just wait till the person comes back. It's not like people aren't dying. They're not dying. So let's not call it an emergency because it really isn't right now. In some cases, in some work, you know, people might be dying. And so in that case, that is an emergency, right? Different story. But we, we have a, we have a, like a miscalibrated way of thinking about things sometimes that it's like, this is mission critical. I don't know. Is it really? I think there's time to reevaluate some of those things. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and Trey, I want to get some ideas around your organization and how you're balancing this individual, you know, trying to really manage the individual and, and help them with their burnout versus create some global policies that might help versus the culture that we're talking about. Does that culture support those policies? Can you talk about how you're working uh, with that at Splunk? Sure. We're, we're in an interesting place in our journey. We're a we're approaching being a 20 year company and we um, <clears throat> we're in the tech sector. And so there's, there's a lot that we're contemplating in terms of our overall company culture or in terms of, you know, what, <clears throat> what does it mean to be, um, as we call it a splunker, right? What is that splunker experience? And it's all about what is the relationship to our purpose, mission value? What is our relationship to the job and the role, the career? our leaders, um, and then overall um, to the customer relationship. And so we we actually kind of embarked on a, a, a whole, what we call cultural transformation that started before the pandemic. And then the pandemic um, changed a lot of things. What we were, um, <clears throat> what we were really, I guess, forward thinking in our own minds was when the pandemic hit, we um, decided that we were gonna be virtual first. Um, and we have um, employees in 30 countries and we have over 50, uh, 50 or 60 office locations, but we decided to go fully remote. And that was a big decision, which had huge cost implications um, and implications to how work is done. Uh, but because we're in the data business and we know that we were helping companies shift their business to, um, you know, to an online environment, we ourselves, took that stance. And so we started looking at how work was done. And then we started looking at what are the points of connection? How do we connect our splunkers across the organization when, when they're not coming into buildings? And so we came up with creative ways there to be able to help people connect by trying to use you know, technology to bring people together. Um, thirdly, we also looked at, again, the individual benefits that we could offer that are linked to our culture. And so we implemented global rest days to, to Andrew's point. What we've seen in the data is it's a day off for everyone across the globe. And so we do see that that actually works well, as opposed to just giving individual days that people could take off and then still have the, the risk of, of compiling a lot of work while they're out of the office. We really upped our, um, you know, our offerings as it related to um, uh, wellness and wellness benefits. And then we just gave our employees a uh, quarterly stipend for them to choose their own adventure, if you will, around uh, wellness as, as a part of it. I think the biggest opportunity that has come up in this discussion is 
you know, how do we how do we look at the design of work? Um, and that's probably where we're we're lagging behind because we had a number of leadership changes. Um, we are are looking at our overall structure continuously. And now we're getting to the point where we say, hey, we need to look at everything that comes from the focus that we have in the organization, that's our strategies and our initiatives, how that cascades through the organization. And then what are, again, the talent and management practices for us making decisions and then driving um, customer value. So we're really looking at the business from that lens um, and in hopes that, you know, this is going to address some of the um, some of the burnout issues. But with high attrition, we're moving, <laughs> you know, in somewhat um, uncharted and unfamiliar territories, just trying to make sure that we we cover the business. So um, there's a lot of levers that we can pull, but we have to be strategic and we want to make sure that we are listening to the employees, giving them um, opportunities. And I think the big, um, I think factor that we're trying to learn about is how do you deal with this through an individual or diversity, equity, and inclusion lens? Because everyone has a different view of the relationship with work, relationship with colleagues, relationship with coming into the office. How do we how do we leverage that? promote more agency, but also make sure that um, employees are connected. Thanks, Trey. And, and Joan, interested in what you're doing at New Balance. And I think Trey mentioned, you know, at the end there, a great point is, you know, it is quite a challenge to take a diverse workforce and try to figure out how you will processes and procedures. At the same time, you may be trying to change your culture a little bit to, to accommodate some of these things. Can you talk a little bit about how you're dealing with all of those challenges at, at New Balance? Yeah, absolutely. So much that Trey said and has experienced really um, resonated with me as well as terms of the in terms of the New Balance journey. And I will say, you know, out of the gate, I think we had some very well intentioned back to some of Andrew's points, uh, but it, ultimately what I would call random acts of wellness and well being. And what we really quickly began to understand is that a more strategic approach was going to be essential and a shared responsibility. And Trey talked about DE&I and actually our thinking around this was not dissimilar to our thinking around DE&I and that we have a shared re responsibility. However, that responsibility is not shared equally. And so no surprise, you know, we definitely leaned in and provided resources, programs, et cetera, at the individual level. And we did ask our associates to prioritize their well-being, to speak up and let us know where and when they needed support. Uh, we also really asked that um, folks join us for discussions around where the ways of working were contributing to uh, stress and burnout such that we could uh, try and remove um, some of those barriers. But unquestionably, as a company, we really did um, see that the lion's share of responsibility for the environment, if you will, and for the contributors to burnout really um, were with us more so than at the individual level. Uh, and so there's a number of things that we've done there, right? And one is really being relentlessly committed to understanding associate experience and to removing barriers. And another thing that we have done with intention is really paid attention to what we call hot spots in the organization where we identify where um, individuals or teams are under particular uh, stress and pressure and proactively go in search of information and data, et cetera, to see if we can um, you know, solve problems before we get to a breaking point. Thanks, Joan. And, and Sarka, same, same question. And, you know, as uh, Joan and Trey were talking, you know, it seems like the, the leadership is, is an important piece of that. You know, as, as um, Andrew mentioned, you know, if, if somebody, say, if a leader takes PTO, but they're still, you know, firing off emails, that, that can be a, a bad message, even if your culture says that that's okay and, you know, people support, you know, at the, at the lower levels you know, as, as those leaders are doing that, that's what people are going to think is, is necessary. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and as well as, you know, some things that, that you've maybe done that uh, have been successful as far as helping with the burnout and the culture change even within that. Oh, you're on uh, mute, Sarga. 
Thank you. Um, you I, would, I will admit I have definitely been guilty of trying to take time off and then feeling like I have to answer my Slack or answer my email. Um, and I very quickly, especially as we, uh, in my last organization implemented flexible time away from work or unlimited, unlimited PTO. Um, it really became about culturally and kind of going back to what Andrew talked about a little bit, a little bit ago is a reset on your culture, right? Who are you, but who, who were you pre pandemic is likely who you're not going to be in this post pandemic world, just given everything we've all learned so many things that we've heard, um, us talk about here on the call today. And so it was really a conscious and intentional effort to put something like that into place, but then rethinking like, what are our, what are our core values? How are we going to show up as leaders? How are we ourselves going to turn off? Um, and I had one of my um, direct reports tell me like, when you're on leave, just go on leave. And one of the things that we talked about, you know, what I talked about with my direct reports is um, building in some level of trust where, you know, there might be decisions that have to be made while I'm, you know, disconnecting and spending time with my family. And it is important for me to model that type of behavior to my team because I care so much about their, you know, their, not just not their productivity, but their own burnout and their own satisfaction and engagement and fulfillment in what they're doing day in and day out. And so there were times where I'm like, these decisions might come up, hey, so-and-so, like, I'm going to delegate this to you. If this comes up, feel, I trust you to make the right decision. You have all the information here, how I would go about looking at something like this, if I were to make a decision. Um, but I leave it up to you because, so Andrew's point is like, you know, we're not, at least what I wasn't doing was not brain surgery. It wasn't anything that was, um, I had to be there to make that decision. So I think trust is a really big component of this to really support um, the people in the organization. Another thing was not just those of us in higher level leadership positions, but also thinking about our middle management. In our situation, we had um, a lot of newer managers that were stepping into roles where they're managing teams of people um, where maybe pre-pandemic they were co-located in the same office. And then we made a decision to go, you know, more of a remote first. In some places we have hybrid where if there is an office and as we've opened up offices, you're able to go into the office, but obviously, so you have more of this hybrid world. How are we empowering and, and teaching and enabling these, the, these middle managers or these new managers um, that have never done this before, how to lead in this type of an environment, how to support the people that are reporting into you, how to model that behavior. Um, we've put together, um, we've invested in leadership development, I mean, focus specifically on leading people and developing people in a post-pandemic world, um, teaching them and giving them different tips on how to better connect your teams, especially if they're not co-located. What would that look like? How do you recreate, you know, ad hoc interaction, like the water cooler conversations? There was so much connection, like authentic connection that was built in a time uh, where we could just walk by each other in the water cooler and, and have fun conversation about what'd you do this weekend? Oh, we should go hang out. Let's go, let's go grab, you know, a bite at lunch. Like that type of honest, authentic connection is not happening anymore, which I truly believe is also leading to a bit of the burnout that's happening. I don't think it's all about the work. I do think it's also the lack of connection and like the lack of true, like this is a friend that I have at work that I know I can trust. And if I am having a bad day, um, I'm going to be given grace because they know me as a person outside of work and they know that I'm a good person. I might just be someone having a bad day. So we've really thought about how do we create some, how, how do we create more of that and enable our middle managers to feel that type of um, confidence in, in connecting and leading people. Thanks, Eric. And, and Andrew, so this is your chance, Andrew, to provide some uh, positive uh, slant to this, right? I mean, you listen to this, right? And it's a lot, right? You got to change culture. You got to change the management styles of folks. We got to get everybody connected. You know, there's a whole lot there to figure out. Can you talk about some, you know, maybe some organizations that you've dealt with that did some things that had some positive impacts on burnout? And then maybe some you know, you don't have to name names, but some that maybe didn't things to avoid that you've seen that, you know, stay away from this, you know, just give us a, a little bit of insight as to what's working out there. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll protect the innocent and the guilty on this one, Mike. Um, so the, 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 the thing that I would say, just, you know, tying in the positivity, the optimism, the possibility thinking is I'll reinforce something that both Trey and Joan said, and I know Sarka believes this because this is like through and through who she is, is getting people involved who are closest to the work. Everything that we've heard about today has some element of reinvention, rethinking, reimagining, all right? Not, not trying to take the same thing and apply it to, to new circumstances. 
and there's nobody that understands the way that work is happening better than the people who are actually doing the work. Trey mentioned something about, you know, like, you know, these are uncharted times or uncharted territories. That's exactly right. None of us, none of us have been through this exact play ever before. This whole amalgamation of, you know, the great resignation and political stuff and social unrest and, you know, economic things and global pandemic. It's like, none of us have ever been through this before. So as leaders, why would we pretend that we know all the answers? And what, or why would we think that, you know, from a bold, boldness standpoint that we should know all the answers? This is a great time to be vulnerable, to be humble, and to engage your workforce. Folks who are new and folks who are tenured to say, we've really got to rethink this. And if we're rethinking our customer experience, our employee experience, the most effective ways for work, work to get done, what I know is human ingenuity is incredible. It's untapped. So one example, we worked with an organization and when the pandemic actually started, we one of the things we did to be of service and support at Shift is we offered a free survey, called it a remote work survey. And we offered it free to any organization who wanted to participate. The hundreds of hours that we put into this that we gave away, I can't even count that high. I can count pretty high. I can't count that high. But you know, one organization who took us up on it, we did this remote work survey because we wanted to help these leaders understand how their people were feeling about these changes in the way that work was happening. And through this work, what we learned in this one organization was their people really felt more isolated, more siloed, more fragmented, more alone, more hopeless than they really ever had. And this is a great organization. And so what we did with them was we, we, you know, we took that survey information, we shared it with the organization's help. We did this together. We shared that information out to the people that we surveyed because in many cases, what we see is organizations will do a survey, but they don't share the information out. By the way, hint and tip to everybody on the call, don't bother doing the survey if that's gonna be your approach, right? That's worse, than, that's worse than not doing the survey at all. So we shared the information out and then we enrolled the people in the organization to say, now what should we go do about this? We empower them, we enrolled them, we invited them into the conversation and we prioritized the list down to three essential things. One was really fostering a culture of better collaboration, cross-functional connection. And so we, we did some work for about three or four months, it didn't take that long. We brought these cross-functional teams together. We prioritized the areas where they felt that they could bust these silos and build more connection more effectively. We did some great work you know, in sprints with these small collaborative teams, SWAT teams, maybe like six to eight people. And they really changed the way that they were connecting with folks. And the byproduct of that was their people did feel more connected, more empowered. They redesigned the way that they did like four or five different elements of their work. And it gave them great results and their people felt like they were part of the solution. Nothing was done to them. It was all done with and for them. It was a smashing, smashing success. You want me to give you one that didn't work or are you cool to move on? Yeah, give me one that didn't work really quickly. I'm interested. Yeah, so one that, did, one that didn't work was, you know, we, we, you know, we did a similar survey example. Um, it wasn't a remote work survey, but we did a survey. We tried to help the organization and we did help them understand what was going on. Um, in their organization and the leaders felt like they just knew better. Like even though the data from the employees said X, that wasn't the way they were gonna go. Like, no, we understand that people want flexible work arrangements. We understand that people want more leadership development and things like that. And we understand that people are saying that their leaders aren't doing a great job of connecting or inspiring or motivating them. But you know what, the leaders that we have, they've been here a long time. You know, they were valuing loyalty over performance, which is a problem. And they were, they were too rigid in, in wanting to really reinvent things because the senior leaders, senior leaders who are like, how many levels away from where the work is happening felt like they just knew better. And it had the exact opposite effect, which was people got more disenfranchised, regrettable attrition spiked, they had more people leaving the organization. It was a problem that they're still working through, frankly, still working through. That's a challenge, as you mentioned, you know, you take a survey and if you uh, either don't share the results or just ignore the results, right, the, that's even worse than not asking somebody, you know, at all. So, um, you know, Trey, I'm interested, you know, as we're talking about some of the challenges and things that you do to try to help with burnout, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things that you might do to change individually, you know, or policies. And I think communication is a big part of that, right, as you're trying to change your culture, you're trying to kind of get some new ideas out there. Can you talk about how you're trying to communicate um, the things that you're doing 
uh, to try to get them to be accepted within your organization. Because lots of times, you know, you can say, hey, take that day off. You know, as we've mentioned, you know, hey, unlimited PTO, go ahead and take it off, right? If you don't communicate that enough, or you, you know, sometimes people don't buy into that. Can you talk about how you're dealing with that? Mike, that's a very great point. Actually, this week, um, our CEO and I were talking, uh, we were joking about the fact that we have weekly town hall meetings. Um, he's relatively new in his role. Um, and so part of his onboarding is to connect with the, um, the workforce in different audiences every single week. Um, and um, he started off his, uh, his, his town hall this week saying, as I've said, at every town hall meeting, we are not requiring everyone to come back to the office. Now we've officiated that, we have put it in writing, we say it. Um, so your, your question is very timely because communication, I think in this environment um, is really a really important um, management tool, a cultural tool to monitor because you can believe as a leader or as an, a practitioner um, that you're communicating and it's not getting through, no matter what format you put it in, whether you're standing in front of the audience, you're putting it in writing. Um, and so it's very important um, and it is the catalyst, right? It catalyzes all these great ideas that have been um, discussed thus far. And I think you just can't grow weary in communicating and communicating consistently, communicating authentically, being vulnerable when you don't know something, don't don't feel compelled to answer something for the purpose of an answer, but but humanize um, everything that you're doing. And you know, I I want to take this time to just compliment um, this audience and the profession of of HR practitioners because I can't think of a group that has gone through more burnout. Um, our individual company metrics show that that um, attrition in HR is probably the second or third highest in our organization, and so. Um, it's really, really um, important to our to our livelihood, to our craft, and our contribution um, in in um, in the world today. And so, I would say to that end, um, really, really um, exhibit compassion to yourselves, and that you're making a difference, even though you're in uncharted territory and trying to figure things out. The organization is looking to you for answers. Um, a lot of the tried and, tried and true tools are what we need to, to really exhibit. Listen to your employees, prioritize, act on it, and then engage in communication as I described before. And regardless of the, the, the challenge, the diagnosis or the opportunity, um, communication um, with compassion, I think is, is a difference maker. Thanks, Trey. And, and Joan, interested in, you know, as Trey mentioned, you know, you can say something, you know, 15 times and, you know, it, it doesn't always take. Have you, do you have some things that you've uh, done at New Balance that you've seen be successful in getting those messages to kind of take hold a little bit? Yes, absolutely. It's so interesting because if we think about the experience of HR as a function and, and all of us as HR professionals in recent years, you know, the, the extent to which we are center stage and, um, being viewed as a, instrumental partners through this, I would say the equivalent of that are our, our friends and colleagues in the communication space. And I would say they have been called up, if you will, to the same extent and are in many ways taking advantage of the opportunity that that uh, provides to a great extent. And at New Balance, we, we actually, there are so many places where despite the challenges, we are light years ahead of where we might have been otherwise. And communication is absolutely uh, one of those places. And so we so, have fortunately a CEO and a senior team very much engaged in understanding the importance of uh, bringing their voice uh, at this time and as we go forward. And we've had a lot of uh, fun, frankly, with leadership meetings and town hall meetings and trying so many different uh, kind of vehicles and avenues, whether it's a video series, uh, we have a candid conversation series, we have a series that uh, brings to life individual associates around the globe and their experience with life work integration, which has been a really big hit. Um, and so it's really been interesting uh, to try and build out our strategy there and really just see what what lands and um, you know what hits and and what doesn't. 
last thing I'll say here is it, we have also really recognized, and I think Trey made a similar point earlier about what we find is in communication, like everything else that we're doing, there is no one size fits all um, solution. And so it's been really interesting to see how our different efforts resonate with different populations or not, and then be able to lean in um, in those places in support of particular um, associate groups and so on. Thanks, Joan. And Sarka, interested in your uh, thoughts around communication, any nuggets that you found to be successful or helpful in trying to get those messages to really stick within your organization? Uh, you're on mute again. <laughs> oh, doing that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, Joan and Trey both touched on this, right? There is no one size fits all. How one group of people might want to be communicated with is very different than another group that might want to be communicated with. Or if you're a global company, even trying to schedule town halls can be really difficult, right? What works in the U.S. or in one area might not work in another area. And so how do you balance that out and still get um, that, that type of connection? Um, so, you know, they gave a lot of really great examples from a, from an enterprise perspective. Um, I've always loved, you know, even leveraging something as simple as SharePoint and having a lot of different types of information because people want, not everybody wants information, not just the same way or, but even the same kind of information. Some people might not be as interested in hearing about the results, you know, our latest financial results. Some people want to know more about who am I working with and, you know, or what are some highlights of different products that we're launching? Um, I want to learn more about different employees in the organization, or I want to learn how, you know, what our people team is doing on the talent growth and development side, what programs are coming out. And so really thinking about a place that's more of a uh, somewhat of a one-stop shop where you can get all different kinds of information that's constantly updated. Um, I think that makes it obviously our jobs that much more challenging. Um, like Joan said, not even just on the HR people side, but also on the communication side, on our marketing side, for our leadership team. It's just, it's a lot to think about how do we keep information and things that we want to communicate fresh. Um, but I also think about it also from more of a, um, of a team perspective, right? I go back to creating that authentic connection. I think someone asked the question, like, how do you create authentic connection when you're in this type of an environment right now? Um, you know, we've done different things where we've created different Slack channels, you know, whether it's a water cooler channel, we did one for parents, working parents. And, um, you know, every Friday people share pictures of their kids, like a funny picture from the week or, hey, you know, it's back to school. How are your parents feeling? I'm feeling this way. And you're really starting to see a lot of, um, you know, people leading the way of being vulnerable and how they're feeling about different elements of their life. If I just use that as an example, because it was one that really resonated with me just seeing um, how quickly, you know, someone just created the Slack channel for working parents because there was a, someone saw a need that I don't know other parents and I really could use some advice. And it just took a work, just took a life of its own and the authentic connection and vulnerability that's happening just across a Slack channel and friendships that are being made because people are sharing pictures of their children. I mean, that's just an easy thing to create and easy. It takes two seconds to create a channel on Slack, or you could do the same thing on teams. Um, we've done stuff where we do, you know, every two weeks we have this coffee chat and you have, you know, you partner up people and they spend 30 minutes, you know, someone scheduled 30 minutes and you just get to know each other. And, and it's all, it's all personal talk. None of it is about work. None of it is about a project that they're working on. Um, but then we've also thought about work that is being done um, where you might have a team that is understaffed, but you have other people that are curious and want to learn more and maybe have a little bit more time on their hands. And they're like, Hey, I want to learn something different. And, you know, there's a way to just pull that type of, pull out those types of people that want to volunteer into, in learning different areas of the business, getting projects, you know, little project teams together and working on a specific small project. And then that way people are, are learning. Um, and so they're, and even learning together and challenging each other and being curious is creating authentic connection. Um, and then it's also creating purpose for people, right? I mean, and we all, we, we said it early on now more than ever, I think what the pandemic has taught a lot of us is we want to feel connection to the work that we're doing. We want to feel like there is purpose in what we're doing. It's not like I'm just going to work just to work and collect a paycheck. That is okay. If there are people that that is how they view work, that's also okay. But there are also people that want to feel like I'm making an impact um, day in and day out. And I, and I want to be connected to that purpose. So how are we doing that? And through the different modes of, of communication. Thanks, Sarka. And, and Andrew, uh, Sarka had a perfect lead into the question I wanted to ask you next around 
the idea that we're in a remote hybrid environment, most companies are, you know, there are some that, that aren't as much, but, uh, you know, can you talk about, you know, how that's contributing or how that's affecting burnout, the feelings of isolation for individuals where they don't feel connected, they don't feel that authentic connection, maybe to the company, maybe to the individuals. Can you talk about the, the, the impact of that to, to burnout? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, back to right to left thinking. When leaders and organizations are not thinking about their desired outcome, for example, they might say, you know what? really building a connected culture, an authentically connected culture is a strategic pillar of ours as it relates to our people who drive our business results. Absent of that approach, you are going to find greater pockets. This is what all the data that we see and that, you know, that we've researched on our own continues to show is that isolation, stress, anxiety, um, burnout increases. When it's more well thought out, not to say we can't do something when we're remote or we can't do something with our, when we're hybrid, but to change the frame and to say, how might we, how could we, how do we accomplish this goal? If our goal is to be authentically connected, enroll your workforce, ask them to help you figure that out. For companies that we see that are doing that really well, levels of connection to people's personal priorities, to their peers, to their bosses, to their work, and to the company, which are the five points of authentic connection that, that we really study, they all go up. When it's done in a fragmented, whack-a-mole, non-strategic kind of way, burnout goes up. So the biggest recommendation I would give to our, you know, to our audience here is be strategic, think holistically, start right to left. Everything else unfolds from there. Thanks, Andrew. And, and Trey, interested in, you know, in, in dealing with a hybrid workforce, you know, what are some of the things you're thinking about as part of your strategy to keep folks connected and keep them not feeling isolated uh, in, in your organization? Yeah, we're, we're thinking about several things. I mean, we're, we're doing everything from formal interviews and, and studies around what is the role of work <laughs> and how does work relate to office and how um, to Andrew's point, how do all those connections intersect when you have a truly distributed or virtual workplace? Um, with that as well, back connecting it back to um, the opening thoughts about the role of the manager and the leader. Um, oftentimes, we look to them um, to be the, the central ingredient to this, but they're also employees themselves in trying to react to all the various changes. And so how do you not just inundate them with saying, hey, we need the we need the manager to lean in more, have more one-on-ones, check in with your employee, look at your engagement data and respond to it. Like you have to recognize that they're going through their own adoption um, and, uh, curve as well. And so really getting clear on what that role is and then how do we really enable it in a way that they wanna learn? Because we've seen such trends as, um, you know, training, um, training participation go down for managers and we feel like we're offering great you know great offerings but they themselves are saying hey we we're we're struggling to find the information we need or the time to be able to look at it and so across the whole ecosystem it really is about looking at the data making sure we're humanizing it getting the voice of the leader so that we can just redefine a lot of things in a measured way um, because a lot of the ideas that are shared across um, today from our colleagues are, 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 for some organizations, are bold and transformational and is, is a huge step to make. And so we're also looking at like, what is that cost of conversion? What is the from to that we're going to and what are going to be those most meaningful changes that are going to happen against what is most likely in most organizations, uh, a, a transformation that's happening with the company or in their industry or, against, you know, the, the bigger macroeconomic trends. So being really, really clear on what you're going to go after and how you're going to do it and do it in a very change management uh, focused way. Thanks so much, Trey. And, and Joan, we got about a minute left. I'd love to get your thoughts around how you're helping uh, get your folks connected authentically, or if you found some things that have been successful. Yeah, we absolutely have. So let me give you the just a Reader's Digest version. First of all, we got a lot of input across the organization to anchor into our specific hybrid model. And with a lot of input from associates, what we determined was the best model for us was what we call our work-based hybrid model, which in its most basic form means we come together in person to do work when that work is best done together. And outside of that, there's a significant amount of 
autonomy and flexibility around where and when people work. We opened our facilities 24 seven to all associates as one of many signals uh, that we believe that. In addition to that, we really got at the root of understanding what associates biggest concerns were around any kind of return to office or coming together. Things like commute and safety from a pandemic standpoint and really went specifically after those things to address them and have some solutions that we then communicated very directly around. Here's what you said, here's how we've responded. Where did we get it right? Where do we need to continue to adjust? Beyond that, I would say we've created significant, so beyond coming together for the work, which is the model, we've also really looked at what additional experiences can we give folks to continue to stay connected. And so we're looking at virtual connection and not overlooking that, not making the assumption that that can only be done in person. Things like 10,000 coffees, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, have been a big success virtual forums, and also a lot of coming together as one example together in person for volunteer events, uh, which has been a big um, you know, success uh, for us. It continues to be a place that associates are really passionate about. I'll end this one, and I realize I might uh, be over a minute here, but what we, we continue to say and hold ourselves accountable for is what do we need and resist the urge to say, what have we known? And if we find ourselves falling back into what we used to know, how we used to work, we're all accountable for saying, wait a minute, is that what we knew or is that what we need? Thank you, Mike. No, thanks so much, Joan. And uh, this is a, a fantastic topic, one that I know uh, you know, lots of folks sign up and it's, it's one that's important. So I appreciate all your, your uh, open perspectives and thoughts, you know, the more that we, I think there is no one answer, but the more that we can talk about different ideas, I think the better off we'll all be. So appreciate uh, your uh, participation in the panel uh, today, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.